Hi listeners, Benjamin here. Here we are at the start of 2026. We're feeling our way slowly into the light of a new year. And as is traditional around these parts, we like to spend the first episode just having a look back at some of the fun stories that you might have missed that were covered in the Nature Briefing. And we've been doing this for a few years now. And joining me over those last few years is editor of The Nature Briefing, Flora Graham. Flora, thank you once again for being here. It's my pleasure. And making his debut in this start of the year show is Nick Petrich. How, Nick, how are you getting on? I'm doing well, thank you. I'm excited to start 2026 with you both. Well, let's talk about a few things that have caught our eye then. Flora, why don't you go first? this year. What's the story you're bringing to this podcast? Well, I was very excited to read this story in Science earlier in December, and it's about how researchers have taken advantage of undersea optical cables to detect seismic activity. And I saw this one too, and this is neat because this is reappropriating existing technology. It made me think of, I guess, using the Voyager probes for a different thing they were originally planned for, or what, turning coal mines into big physics detectors. So getting new use out of existing stuff. Exactly. I mean, you could imagine it'd be very expensive to install hundreds and hundreds of seismic detectors all over the sea floor, but it's information that we would love to have. And this idea has been around for maybe around a decade. The idea that you could shoot a laser down these cables, and by detecting what reflects back from the optical fibers, you can detect whether it be earthquakes or other seismic activity but the really tough part was doing it of course while the cable is in use for something else and so how did they overcome this challenge how did they actually manage to get it to work well what they did was they have managed to design a device that when you shoot a laser down the cable it's actually on a different wavelength from what it's being used for for communications and inside the cable there's going to be naturally very very tiny imperfections just as part of the manufacturing process Mm. and when there's seismic waves as you can imagine these cables very 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 slightly move and shift and these tiny tiny imperfections also move and shift and that actually affects how the laser is reflected back and so then the researchers can figure out from that backscatter the nature of the seismic activity and the beauty then is that of course these cables are all over the place and so you could what build up a a mesh covering a significant part of the earth? Yeah, exactly. So in this case, this cable is actually 4,400 kilometers long. It runs all the way from California to Hawaii. So essentially, it acts like 44,000 separate detectors spread 100 meters apart. So immediately you get this incredible coverage. But just to be clear, this is a prototype. They're showing that it's possible to do this. So it will be some time before it's being used for active observations. Right, because I guess there's a number of things to overcome. Maybe governments are doing things that they don't want heard, for example, or companies are using proprietary technology, that sort of stuff. Exactly. So this is not necessarily public infrastructure. The location of these cables is often kept secret for security reasons, as you can imagine. Telecom companies might hesitate to give scientists access to these cables for security reasons, or you might have to sign non-disclosure agreements. So it's more complex than just firing it all up tomorrow. And is there a lot of seismic activity down there at the ocean bed that scientists are particularly eager to get a look at? So one thing that they could be detecting is the origins of seismic activity that could cause a tsunami. So this could be key to keeping people safe on land. And one of the researchers said what's really great about this is that you don't have to invest in something. You can run it on legacy cables. Martin Karenbach, who was a co-author, said that it's nice to think that you wouldn't have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to have thousands of detectors. Well, I think it's interesting that, say, this can be reappropriated then for other stuff. Let's keep going with this roundup. Nick, you've got a story that also has a sea theme, I suppose. What have you got? So, yes, you are correct. I've been reading in Life Science about an ancient boat and a fingerprint that was found on it, which could uncover a little bit about who was on this boat and why they were there. Right. So I'm guessing this is a pretty old boat then. Yeah, this is a 2,400-year-old boat, and it was excavated from the Hjortspring Moes Bog in the 19th century. And what's understood about this boat is that it was trying to attack some people on the island of Ilves, which is a small island off the coast of Denmark. And these raiders, they lost that particular battle. They were defeated, and then the defenders sank the boat, and that allowed it to be preserved because it was sank in war 
water that was a low oxygen environment. So this boat has been knocking about for a while. It's been the source of many mysteries. And one of the mysteries is where exactly it came from. Excellent. We've got a 2,400 year old detective story. Keep going, Nick. So yeah, what's happened with this now is researchers have been looking at the various components of the boat. So when it was excavated in the 19th century, it was chemically preserved, which may have changed some things. So what they did is they searched through the museum collections to look for parts of the boat that hadn't gone through this chemical preservation process. And what they found when they did that was some caulking tar, which is a material that's used to basically hold the boat together and seal it against mm. water. And in that tar, they found a fingerprint, which is presumably from one of the people who, you know, built the boat or maybe repaired it. I mean, what does a fingerprint tell researchers about the history of this boat? Almost nothing in actuality. They were very excited to have found a fingerprint, but they were not able to determine the identity of the person it came from or their sex or anything like that. They did make a 3D model of the fingerprint, which is pretty nifty in of itself, but they weren't able to tell a great deal from that. But the caulking tar itself held a few more clues and it may paint a different picture from what has come before about where exactly this boat has come from. And where did this boat come from? Well, according to the researchers who did this particular study that was published in PLOS One, they believe that it's come from somewhere east from Germany, so somewhere in the Baltic Sea, they reckon. And the reason that they believe that is the caulking tar seems to have pine resin in it. So presumably, it's come from somewhere with a lot of pine forests. And at that particular time, the only places with a lot of pine forests were further north and around that Baltic region. So previously it had been thought that this boat had come from somewhere near what is now Hamburg in Germany. And the reason for that is there were some ceramics on board that seemed to be from that region. So this paints a very different picture because Hamburg and Denmark are quite close, whereas this seems to have come from much further away. So it could suggest that someone's come a long way to do this raid. The question is still why they would have done that. And that's what they hope to uncover in the future because they're aiming to extract DNA from the tar and learn more about the people who built the boat. Right. So it kind of exposes this network between different parts of Northern Europe. It may well do. It could expose trade routes and things like that as well, because obviously one of the questions is, why is there Hamburg region ceramics, but also tar from somewhere else entirely? So there's a lot more mysteries I think this boat holds still. I think what I loved about this story, even though it's quite interesting in and of itself, is just to see a human fingerprint, I think is always really evocative. And these little traces that connect us back to previous people on this earth. I always find that compelling. I agree. I think it's very magical and that's what attracted me to this story and that's why I wanted to tell everyone about it. But I think that's all for this one. Ben, I'm assuming you have a story for us as well that you're excited to tell us about. I am excited to tell you actually, Nick, and this is a story about attracting things. In this case, it's a story that I read about in science based on a paper in science and it's about pollination. And plants have lots of tricks to attract pollinators. Sweet scents, rewards, giant arrows that humans can't see, but <laughs> that insects can, that literally point to, go here, please. But there's another pollination signal, and it's heat. And that's what's been uncovered in this research. And this appears to be an ancient way that plants attracted pollinators long before flowers as we know them arose and this research focuses on a group of plants called cycads now these are very strange things they are prehistoric plants several hundred million years old and they kind of look the same now as they did back when the dinosaurs were alive there's like 300 species of them and some of them are quite endangered but they do something kind of unusual and what do they do, these strange flowerless prehistoric plants? Well, they get hot is what happens. Now, some plants are capable of generating significant levels of heat using energy from metabolic processes, that sort of thing, right? And sometimes this can be absolutely extraordinary, right? I learned that sometimes plants can increase temperatures like 30 degrees Celsius above ambient, so like hot at this point. And this was thought to play a role in 
pollinating in some instances some plants do this maybe to make the scents move through the air you know if you heat the air up the smells go further this sort of thing kind of unclear and it turns out cycads can get hot as well so the bit of these plants that's used for reproduction looks i suppose a bit like a pine cone on top these cone shaped things and one of the authors for the study said they were looking at these plants at night using infrared and these cones glow like beacons and it turns out that this ability is crucial for attracting a pollinator now maybe not the ones that you think of maybe not a bee or a butterfly but in this case a tiny beetle and how did they know that the heat was what was attracting these beetles through some really interesting experiments done in a botanical garden in florida and what they did was in some experiments they labeled these little beetles and could see that they were attracted to these hot cones but was that because they could smell something and what the researchers did was they made fake 3D printed cones and heated those up mm. and you could see that the beetles were attracted to them when they heated up and they went when the cones cooled down so it seemed like this was a way of attracting these pollinators but then i guess the question is how were the beetles picking up on this heat and what exactly was going on to attract them yeah these are great questions and in this research they've attempted to answer that too and it turns out that at the very tip of the antennae of these beetles are some neurons that respond to heat mm -hmm. and we move away from botany into molecular biology here and the team showed that the activity of a gene called trpa1 mm. was really important to be able to detect the heat in these beetles now this gene is known to be involved in infrared detection in mosquitoes and snakes oh. as well and by blocking the activity of this gene the beetles attraction to these cycad cones was diminished sounds like they covered all the bases well there's even more to it so it turns out that different species of beetles can tell the difference between different cycad species based on the heat being given off different plants give off different temperature ranges and some cycad plants the males get hotter a few hours before the female plants which may help the beetles go to the male plants collect some pollen then head off to the next warm place which is the female plant deposit that pollen and pollinate the plant it's this incredible dance that is ancient between these two sets of organisms i mean this sounds like a very intricate dance as you put it but i do wonder is it a delicate dance could this be disrupted by things like climate change for instance right well as i say some of these plants are endangered and it's one of those things where when one part of the puzzle gets taken away you miss the whole picture right so it's existed for hundreds of millions of years and let's hope it exists for hundreds of millions more but that's kind of it for that story before we go today flora obviously you're overseeing the outputs of the nature briefings anything else that caught your eye over the holiday season so i cannot let you go without telling you about this one last story this is something that i read about in new scientist the papers in the astrophysical journal letters and this is about a planet that i'm calling lemon world <laughs> but is technically called PSR J2 322650B. Catchy. You can see why I've given it a little name, and I'm really hoping this will catch on. <laughs> now, you know, we've almost become used to hearing incredible, amazing exoplanets that have extreme situations, but this one is really one of the most bizarre that I think has ever been discovered. I mean, its discoverer, Michael Zhang, calls it an evil lemon. <laughs> The reason is because it orbits a pulsar. So this is a rapidly spinning neutron star, incredibly dense. You know, one teaspoon is as heavy as the Isle of Manhattan and all that kind of stuff. And it orbits so fast that one of its days is only 7.8 hours. Wow. So it is whipping around this, right. this incredible pulsing, radiating, incredibly dense star incredibly fast. The star itself spins 300 times a second. Yeah. So as you can imagine, this is not, you know, an easy life for this planet. <laughs> and the intense gravitational relationship with its star means it's actually pulled into a lemon shape. So that's why we're calling it Lemon World. It's being totally stretched and strained. And not only that, its atmosphere 
contains molecules of carbon, which scientists were very surprised to find because there's this idea that it just couldn't have these complex carbon molecules in this situation. So not only is it lemon shape, it's deep red, probably has clouds of graphite in the atmosphere. So this is really like Eye of Sauron kind of stuff. <laughs> it's probably at its coldest point, maybe 650 degrees Celsius. So very hot. Warmer than a cycad. Yeah. I mean, this is not a place to go skiing. <laughs> and unlike most other planets, the wind blows in the opposite direction of the planet's rotation. So this is just completely bizarre and seems to kind of defy the established models of planet formation. So what could be more fun than discovering a planet that not only looks weird and acts weird and is spinning at all these crazy speeds, but also makes us think, well, we don't know everything about how these kinds of planets are formed. I do recommend people check out the Nature Briefing to see a picture of this planet. I mean, artist impression, artist impression, let's be clear. <laughs> artist impression. But like when I first saw it, it was like, what on earth is this because it didn't look like a planet at all to me so yeah it is very weird interesting planet for sure well when neutron stars give you lemons it's time to make <laughs> lemonade i think we should probably <laughs> leave it there for this first podcast of the year flora while you're here why don't you tell folk listening where they can sign up for the nature briefing to get more stories like this delivered directly to their inbox oh well please do pop on over to nature.com slash briefing to sign up for free and we will put links to all of today's stories up as well but for the time being flora and nick thank you both so much for being with me today thank you thank you very much ben